Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Arelis Hernandez, a reporter with the Washington Post. Joining me today is Kiara Alegria Yudes, her Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. Uh, Kiara Alegria Yudes, sorry, I messed up there. <laughs> her memoir, My Broken Language, is now out on paperback. Welcome, Kiara. Hi, thank you. Awesome. Well, we're going to start from the very top with the title of your book, My Broken Language. Why was language such a fertile area of exploration for your memoir? Um, and Arelis, just so you know, I can't see you, but I'm just going to pretend like I'm seeing your face and I can hear you loud and clear. So um, can you ask that question again? Yeah, yeah, no, I, we'll see if we can work on that on our end as well. But we're going to start the title. I was just wondering about my broken language and why you thought language was such a fertile area for exploration in your memoir. You know, I am a diaspora Boricua. I was born and raised in Philadelphia um, in the 80s and 90s during my childhood. And my first language was English. My mother's first language, who was born in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, was Spanish. And though I did learn conversational Spanish and studied it and, and worked very hard, my Spanish was never close to as good as my mother's. And at a certain point in my life, I thought this marked a real failure on my part, um, a failure to live fully in my culture, a failure to be who I should be, um, a failure to honor my mother and her path and all of the relatives that I was close to. And as I wrote this book, um, I what I learned more about was the context of my own language failure in the history of colonial Puerto Rico and how language has been such a, um, a path of colonizing the island. And that actually, um, you know, there's a real context that my multilingualism um, is born out of. And it's not a failure, it's, it's a context. So my broken language is, that's part of it. That's part of why I wanted to explore, you know, how, did, how do I speak and why? And what can I do with my broken language in terms of giving a voice to the stories I grew up absolutely loving? No, I totally hear you in that. Also, member of the diaspora, Puerto Rican, yeah, grew up in the D.C. area. Um, but, I, you know, in, we all have different ways of how navigating those cultures and the different languages, brokenness or not, has shaped our sense of self and who we are. And, and I'm curious how that navigation, that journey of yours, helped to shape your creative voice as you came into your own. So spoken languages and written languages were just part of it. Uh, I grew up as a musician too. Um, I grew up listening to such different kinds of music and participating um, in such different kinds of music. So for instance, um, my mother was crowned as a santera of jungle in Lukumi uh, during my childhood. And her the, the living room ceremonies she would host often would have bata drum, which is the bata is the voice of an orisha itself. Um, so music was ceremony for me. Music was, my aunt Linda Hudes was a composer in New York. So I would take a greyhound and come and see her play at CBGB. I'd see her play her original scores for the Big Apple Circus. She would take me to rock clubs afterwards to see Etta James or Steel Pulse. I had music all around me. And as a somewhat depressed child, um, I had started learning to play piano and I would play really sad, treacly song music like Chopin Nocturnes. And it was actually the language of music became a way to process physically um, a lot of my cultural confusion and also just a lot of my adolescent depression. So again, that's another language I grew up in processing and um, kind of pulling from the different influences around me. And how did that shape, you think, your creative voice in the writing now of your memoir and also of the writing you've done in the past, including uh, your Pulitzer Prize winning uh, piece, Water by the Spoonful? There's this notion that artists have an authentic voice. Um, authenticity comes up so much for, I think, a lot of artists of color in a way that I wonder, do um, white artists have the same, um, are they asked, are they expected to be authentic? And somehow, as I forged an artistic voice, an artistic path, I, I interpreted this notion of authenticity to mean um, 
consistency and singularity of voice. And it was just something I could never pull off. I speak in different ways on different days and I pull from different languages for different pieces. And what I started to learn was that I really needed to kind of embrace the chaos and the multiplicity. And oftentimes those voices and languages are at odds with each other. So that in some ways my authentic voice involves a conflict of self at all times. I'm uh, mixed race and mixed culture. I was born to a brown Boricua woman, a white Jewish father um, with very different class backgrounds too, uh, very different spiritual backgrounds. And so as I, and this isn't like a discovery I made one day as an artist and then it was easy, you know, as cake from there on out. This is work I do every day to say, how do I remember to live in that messiness, in that messiness of voice and in the multiplicity of language and live in those contradictions? You go into deep detail in your memoir about that messiness, right? That you had to declare in your name or have explained your name in kindergarten to classmates and you declare that you were half English, half Spanish. Um, and when people ask you, what are you, what do you want readers to take away from, you know, describing all that, that messiness? I think I, something about language is that, and, you know, poets know this really well, is that we, language becomes so familiar. It becomes invisible. We stop noticing it. Um, and I think one of the fun things that happened when I was writing my broken language is it helped me notice language again. For instance, there is a chapter on my mom's accent, right? Because my mom, I grew up in Philly. I had a very different spoken accent than my mom, uh, who really wasn't immersed in the English language until age 11. And so my friends would be like, oh, your mom, you know, your mom has an accent when they called back then when each household had one phone as opposed to a phone per person. <laughs> and um, really noticing and remembering how there were times in my life when I would correct my mom. It's hard for me to even say out loud without getting emotional. Um, and I think I would do it in a loving and playful way. But actually, as I was kind of correcting her pronunciation, was I reinforcing an outsider status that she already had to struggle with on a daily level as a grassroots organizer, um, as an advocate for the Boricua community in Philadelphia. And actually, what I've come to realize, and I, I just treasure this, I don't, I don't know what I expect others to take away from this, but this is what I took away from it. And I want to share this, which is that she taught me English. I work in the English that my mom taught me. And this is an, a language, because she wasn't born into it, she doesn't take it for granted. She notices the English language all the time when she speaks it. And therefore, actually can be sometimes far more creative than us native English speakers who just take it for granted. It just rolls off our tongues. My mom is a beautiful English speaker, but she sometimes, in the process of translating her thoughts, comes up with these gorgeous, strange ways of expressing herself in a way that she earned the English language in a way I never had to. So in expressing that chapter, I have actually heard from other people who grew up in different languages than their parents or children. And they were grateful that I pointed out, you know, the ways that these language differences kind of create gulfs in our families, but also create bridges. I wondered, have you ever asked your mom how she felt when you did correct her and, and what did she say? <laughs> My mother is a very confident woman. And despite a world that, you know, at various times told her her spirituality was not cool, her accent was not cool, her skin tone was not cool, her feminism was not cool despite all those things she knew she was cool so i don't think she was sweating me being a brat or ignorant at times i don't think she had to grapple with it as much as i did um that being said i did there's a point in the book where i i wonder you know the island means a lot to my mom we still have family there um we still have a home there and i wondered like 
did somehow having me, this fair skinned English first Philly kid, did it make her feel less Boricua somehow? Did I actually pull her away from that universe? So that's, um, but she she says no, that that's not the case. <laughs> so did you ever officially apologize? I know you write in the book and later in the essay for the Washington Post, you know, if your mom doesn't disown you, did you, did you eventually like have to do make that apology? She wouldn't accept it. And um, not because she's mad about it, but she, she tells me I have no reason to apologize to her. In fact, when the Washington Post, um, I, I adapted that chapter in an essay for the Washington Post last week. And the headline was that I owe English language learners an apology, starting with my mother. I, I, my mom was livid about that headline. She said, you have to have them change it. You absolutely do not owe me an apology. <laughs> but I said, you know, it's, it's okay, mom. It's okay. It's, yes, I do. <laughs> No, I totally hear you on that. And if you uh, indulge me here, uh, like my father has been in the United States from Puerto Rico, from Guaynabo for 35 years or more now. And he plays mm -hmm. these games, these word game puzzles on his phone. And all, every so often I hear him say, God, English is a stupid language. Like he just has like a really <laughs> hard time squaring the words that, you know, they're asking for in these apps with, you know, what is still, he still dreams and, and thinks and sleeps in, in Spanish. Um, so no, I, I've totally had to also apologize to him for <laughs> correcting him my entire life. And that said, I, you know, I want to move forward to when you got your Yale acceptance letter and that you said in the book that it blew your mind that, you, you know, your, your family members that your loved ones couldn't read it. What was it like? And how did that fit into your exploration of, of language in this book? Yeah. So when I got into Yale, you know, being the first in the family to go to college and um, really knowing that I spent a lot of time at my abuela's house. That was the after school hang. That was the holiday hang. And abuela had had the fortune of having going to school through second grade. And let me tell you, she used that second grade education. She was quite smart. She did her Bible study every day. She wrote poems about nature, um, but that's a humble education. Um, and so I was well aware. My mother would have loved to have gone to college and she self-educated all her life to this day, but she didn't have the luxury of going and getting a college degree after high school. She had work to do in the community um, and she had to earn. So getting that Yale acceptance letter, you know, it was it was humbling. It's you really contextualize yourself and your path. Um, but it also came with some expectations that proved to be erroneous because I didn't know what to expect. And for instance, I had come from such a multiplicity of cultures and musical music uh, languages, as I mentioned, also spiritual paths. My mom is a Santera. I used to go to Quaker meeting. My mom did activism work with them. My dad being a secular Jew. Um, and so I figured that Yale would kind of expand, my education there would expand on those um, multiple voices. But I actually found that the Western education um, really shut out a lot of the traditions that I had been um, studying and engaging with. And so that, you know, that was a shock. That was a culture shock to say, oh, music here doesn't mean music that we dance to. Music here means music we listen to and we study and analyze. That was a real shock to the system. So then how to in that context, how did you reclaim your identity and agency while being at school after hearing comments like you mentioned in the book, I don't come to the theater to hear Spicanese or this is America, we speak English here. Mm -hmm. How do you go about sort of, uh, you know, reclaiming that identity? Well, two years into college, um, I mean, at first I just said, I, hey, I love Bach. I love Mozart. I love Schubert. So let me just do that. So I did that. But after a couple of years, I kind of got antsy. So I was like, okay, my teachers don't want, every time I tried to bring in, you know, Stevie Wonder or Ramito songs to discuss or Selena Reutilio songs to discuss, they were like, yeah, not so much. That's for your free time. That's for the weekend. And so I, I figured out a way, I'm like, I am miss independent study, okay? And, and so I figured out a way to get credit to write a musical. And then I'd got that first. And then what I told them was my musical was going to be about um, characters and their um, Lukumi pathways. So this is an Afro-Caribbean tradition. So the music had to be appropriate to that. 
So that was how I started folding my own stuff into the kind of Western frame. Um, and it worked. And so that's how I've kind of pulled it off since then. I'm strategic. I've studied people like Dolores Huerta, um, like my Titi Ginny, who was a community organizer in, in Philly. And I, I studied their strategies and tactics. And to have the longevity that they have to get their work done, they're forceful, but in a gentle way. And they always kind of have a half smile on. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to be this playwright, going to big regional theaters around the nation, whether they're in very diverse cities like Philadelphia and Chicago um, and LA, oftentimes the, the boardroom is white. The power structures are white. And most significantly for my work, the audiences that they've cultivated over their 80 years as an organization are white. Well, what do I do about that when I am creating Latino characters on stage? How do I handle that? being looked at by a mostly white audience. Um, and I've stuck with it and I found little strategies and but I'm you know I found little strategies and ways to you know make sure my actors don't go crazy. Um, make sure we reach out to all of the Latino family groups and professional organizations in the area. You know, you learn these little strategies to try to make a dent, but it also was hard and I had to take a pause from theater because it actually felt the whiplash of that did take a toll and I said I got to step away from this for a minute it's too, there's too much of a discrepancy between who I'm writing these stories about and who is watching them and this is where the book was helpful because I, I had faith that this book would get into different kinds of hands so it sounds like you created that space for yourself that in the, through independent study to to be able to explore these things but did you did those strategies work in the early part of career or did you have to get to a certain point in your career to be able to have that creative space again to do that kind of work I, you know, the thing is, I'm not a great plug and play writer, so I kind of couldn't fake it till I make it vibe. I had to write from the heart and I had to write from the gut always. Um, I didn't change who I was writing about or how I was writing about them to get to a certain level and then let loose. Um, I, I just actually couldn't do that well. So in some ways that was actually a helpful thing because I would find the spaces and the people that could, you know, that could roll with that and that could get with that. So I wrote two musicals during college that were in, that were looking at especially the Orisha, um, the Lukumi, um, Pantheon and philosophy and life path. It was wonderful to approach this living room practice that my mother had become so strong in it was wonderful to approach it actually as an intellectual and academic and learn more about it um, and write those musicals about it. Then when I got out of college, yeah, I, I was writing, um, you know, one woman shows for me to perform, even though I'm not a performer, just to get my work done. Because I didn't, there's no Latino theater in Philadelphia. There wasn't at that time. Now there is. Um, I was like, so no one's going to perform my work, so I'm going to. And so I, you know, wrote these one woman plays about the women in my family um yeah it's it's just been part of how i roll since the beginning you mentioned in later on in the book towards the end about you know being in college uh miss vogel coming into your life and uh jose rivera's place and that there was this collision between your culture like finally between sort of your academic life and your culture in in an intentional way in the classroom that wasn't sort of independent study you've said you know my histories were never assigned to me how what you know was that a turning point for you and in, in sort of acknowledging that i mean it sounds like it's always been a part of you but at what point did you include those histories into you know what the work that you were doing and the work that you wanted to do I'm so glad you brought up Jose Rivera. Um, I want to rewind for a second to lead up to him. There, sure. there was one moment in undergrad when I was assigned freshman year to read in Tazaki Shange's For Color Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough. That was a major first in my life because I got to the end and the climactic scene is about women um, and they're a laying on of hands. The lead character needs this laying on of hands. And I, I knew that phrase and that concept biblical, like in the biblical sense, but I didn't know it in the colloquial sense. And to have Shange talking about a, a, a world of women's healing 
in that familiar manner, I said, this is the first time I'm reading a vocabulary of myself, of my own life. It changed me forever. Now, fast forward to when I decided to become a writer, I was like, I got to learn how to write. I, you know, I haven't gone to school for this. So I, I enrolled in uh, graduate school years later and I'm reading this play that's been assigned to me by a playwright named Jose Rivera. And, and I was like, it was a gorgeous play. It's called um, Sonnets for a New Century or Sonnets for an Old Century. I can't remember. One of my favorites of all time. And I'm like, what, what's he talking? Something's happening inside me. He's discussing the body in both totally vulgar and totally sacred terms in a way that was so familiar. He's discussing the body with a real urgency and sense of humor and not like a Protestant ethic, but just a real like fleshy vocabulary and spirit to it. And I was like, who is this? Why, what's happening here? It felt so familiar. And then I read his bio and honestly, it's so basic, but he was a Boricua writer. And it, again, I'm tearing up because, you know, these are the people who paved the paths for us, but he was the first Boricua writer I'd ever been assigned to read. And, and um, that was in my twenties. Now I had done independent reading and stuff, but he snuck up on me because I didn't do that on purpose. Paula Vogel, my teacher slipped that one to me. And, you know, book by book, play by play, bit by bit, these authors give you permission to be yourself, not like them, to be like you. And so I owe them the world. And just, you know, one, I got to say his name one more time, Jose Rivera. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit because we're coming short on time, but to you know, the success that you've had with in the heights popularity of the music of Encanto. Now that we hear it's topping the charts, <laughs> the music from Encanto <laughs> and other projects that put, you know, Latinos at the center of the narrative. I mean, are you encouraged? What are the stories that you think still need to be told? So many. Oh my gosh. Yes, I'm encouraged. But to me, it's just about, it's not just about getting the door cracked open. It's about now, now we keep pushing that door wider and wider. Um, you know, one thing that you had asked me earlier, what do I hope people take away from this book? One of the things I hope is a result of this book is just simply more books right beside mine on the bookshelf. You know, I can't represent the entire community. It's a laughable notion that I, that I would even try. I want, you know, my cousins to write their books too. Actually, one of my cousins did while he was in prison. He sent me his book. He said, you always inspired me. You always wrote your story. I want that to happen, to multiply so that we start weighing down those library shelves. You know, I want those library shelves to buckle under our weight. So way, way more, you know, as many Boricuas as there are, there's that many Boricua stories. I'm curious, uh, I'm going to go back to a question that I really wanted to ask, which is that when you started writing, you started interviewing your elders. I'm curious about what that experience was like for you and, and whether you would encourage other young Latino writers to, to do the same. You know, that depends. Um, my family has gone through a lot of highs and lows thanks to my like tendency to eavesdrop and, you know, butt into everyone's business. <laughs> but um, I really a, a, an early on interview really cemented that for me. I just used to love hearing their stories, you know, amazing stories of when they arrived in the Bronx, when they arrived in Philly, what happened on the island, what their life was like there. Um, I interviewed my Theo George about his service in Vietnam. This was in 2003, I believe I interviewed him. And it was for one of my first plays. And he never, ever spoke about, oh, he doesn't speak about that. You know, he doesn't talk about Vietnam. He did not get drafted. He enlisted. He was a Marine. Um, and I was like, what right do I have to ask? But I still, if I was going to interview him, I wanted to ask. I wanted to write a play about Puerto Rican service men and women in the United States military. So I go to his place. I ask him one question. What year did you enlist? And he spoke for three hours straight about it. He laughed. He wept. He told me about love affairs. He told me about blood on his hands. He told me what it means for a Marine to be cleanup crew in a war. It was heavy. And I called him the next week to say thank you, Theo, for opening up to me like that. And he said, I was about to call and thank you. I said, why? He said, because I haven't felt this light in 30 years. 
And I'll never forget that. And that really cemented for me the value of just giving someone a platform to tell their story. I think he was looking to share these stories, but didn't have, there's not like an appropriate space in civilian life <laughs> to discuss these things. And so I felt like, wow, even if this play tanks or is no good, the, it made, the interview was worth it. So I think I have time for one more question. I wanted to ask you about what you personally took away from the questions that were raised about Afro-Latino representation in the main cast for the film adaptation of In the Heights. Yeah, you know, I was it was on my mind for years leading up to the production of the movie, in fact, because in my 20 years as a playwright, I have had the real pleasure, one of the things I love about being a player is you create jobs. And I've had the real pleasure to create jobs and roles and hopefully really good roles for extraordinary Latino actors um, in my plays. Afro-Latino, brown Latino, indigenous Latino, white Latino. Um, and I, that's one of actually the things I'm proudest of in my body of work. Um, but having been in those casting rooms, I also am familiar with how it's so easy for institutions and processes to lean towards whiteness. Um, so part of what I did leading up to that process for, and I had never done a movie before, so I, so I didn't know what to expect. Play, playwrights and screenwriters don't have the same casting power um, in film as they do in theater, um, but I knew I would have a voice in the room. And so the first thing I did was I wrote the character of Nina to be purposefully Afro-Latinx so that they couldn't cast it otherwise. It would just have been inappropriate to the role. Um, but looking back on it now, and I really feel strongly and passionately um, that I love our cast and they did such a phenomenal job and I love our movie and I'm very, very proud of that movie. But I do see with hindsight that it was my first movie and I recognized two and maybe three times when I could have been louder in the room and I regret um, I was a little loud. <laughs> my husband and my agent assured me, they're like, you were kind of loud, um, but I could have been louder. And so what my personal takeaway, you know, and I, I regret those moments and I apologize to the community for those moments. But my takeaway is then I got to do better next time. And I know I have decades of work of doing really well behind me that I can call on and, you know, just raise my voice a little louder when I need to. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you, Kiara, for speaking with me. I thank you for your book. Appreciate it, you coming along. Thanks, it was my pleasure. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Go to WashingtonPostLive.com to register for upcoming programs. I'm Arelis Hernandez, and thank you for watching Washington Post Live.